This morning I want to talk about sanctified boldness. You know, there are a lot of people who are just bold because they're full of arrogance. And that's not the kind of boldness that God wants from us. He wants sanctified boldness. Were we able to make a stand in spite of whatever situations and whatever oppositions we face, knowing how to do it is really the most important thing for us. So last Sunday we talked about the sanctified life. Some people just add Christianity to what they're doing. So they say, Lord Jesus, I accept you. I make you a part of my life. But that's not what discipleship is about. Discipleship is about giving yourself wholly to him that he can use you for his kingdom's work. We become soldiers in the army of God. Like the Salvation Army was moved up in an era to, to give us that lesson. I think they went a little too far because they started to put captains and all the rest and all the rest and this. But we have to be careful that we don't go beyond uh, the limits of what God intends for us. We have to learn it well. This morning, my text is taken from Hebrews chapter 10. We read up to verse... Last week, we read up to verse 18. We read from 14 to 18. This week, we are going to go from 19 to 25. Let me read the text, and then we'll talk a little bit. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, not arrogance, boldness by the blood of Jesus, knowing who you are, knowing the sanctified life, is in place only because of the sacrifice that was made for you. Boldness by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let me repeat that. In full assurance of faith. In full assurance of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, not seen. The substance you go out in the morning to start your car, if you have a car. You put the key in the ignition because you're dressed and ready to go. You don't want to try it first to see if it's going to work so you come back later to go. And if it doesn't start, then you start to troubleshoot. You start to look for the problem. But your full assurance that you will get that car going so you can go where you're going. And if something different shows up, you look to solve the problems. We don't start to look for problems before something shows up because we have the assurance. We have that assurance, full assurance, not partial, full assurance. having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for, for he who promised is faithful. For us, God's promises are yea and amen. Faithful. Faithful. 
And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let us pray, Father, this morning we ask for your wisdom, we ask for your guidance, we ask for your understanding. We ask, O oh God, that you will visit with us, mighty God, so that we can be changed and transformed into the, the, the likeness of Jesus, that we might live and serve and give ourselves away to your service. Help us, Lord. We need you. We can't make it on our own. We need you, Lord. So we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In our discussions on the sanctified life, we looked at a variety of scholarly views. Men like J.I. Parker and F.F. F. Bruce, D. Guthrie, and even Charles Finney. The story of Charles Finney is an amazing one. Charles Finney was a lawyer in the New England states of America. That's his eastern seaboard, Boston, and those places. And one day, Charles Finney felt the need for a deeper walk with the Lord. As a Christian, he felt that he didn't have the hunger. He didn't have that deep yearning for the things of God. So he left his office, and he walked, and he went into the backwoods, and he found a place and knelt down and prayed and asked God, to change him, bring him closer. Let him experience the fullness of his love so he could share it with others. And waves and waves and waves came through him until eventually he cried out, oh merciful God, oh merciful God, stop because you killed me. When he rose from his knees, he had no further interest in the law of the land. His full interest and attention was given to the work of God. One day as he was getting off the platform, the train arrived in Boston and he was getting off the platform. A prostitute was trying to solicit him. He didn't quite understand what it was she was talking about or when he fully understood, he went into such deep emotional distress and tears flowing down. He begged God to help this woman to realize her value. The woman became saved right there. Her life was completely transformed. She walked away from that life of prostitution to be a child of God. This is a little lesson of what sanctification does for us because what Charles Finney experienced was the fullness of sanctification. He asked for it, he waited for it, he received it in such waves that he had to beg God to ease up. We too can do that. In Romans 8, it talks about intercession. Friday night, we talked about that. Unless we find a place of intercession, we will not experience the fullness of God's love. A place of intercession is not where we gather in a prayer meeting. That is helpful. But a place of intercession is called the closet. It's a place of privacy where you, you weep and you groan and you, these, these utterances that the work of the Holy Spirit works through us praying for things that we do not understand and can never really understand. But God works because we make ourselves available to transform us and bring us into his grace. And that's what Finney experienced. That's what we need to experience. That's where we need to be looking Proven men helped us to understand the importance of sanctification, and we just glanced over it. It could have taken weeks to study it and to get deeper into it. But if we get, if we get a little whetting of the appetite, we can, we can desire 
or God could put desires in us that we want to go further, we want to go deeper, and it's up to us. Nobody can do it for us. It has to begin with I surrender all to Jesus. Today's lesson advises us on how we are challenged to be bold in our walk with the Lord. It takes humility, but bold meaning strong, bold meaning determined, bold meaning not looking left and right, but looking at where the Lord has taken us and what the Lord is wanting us of us. So let's look at it together because the text tells us clearly Jesus as our high priest opened the holy of holies. Why did he do that? Because he, he, he made it in the old Jewish religiosity or religion, I shouldn't put it down, in the Jewish religion, the high priest entered the holy of holies, the most holy place, once a year. It was, it was regarded as highly sacred. They didn't frequent it. When he was going in, they would tie a cord on his ankle and he'd have little bells on his robe. So as he moved about, they'll hear the ringing of the bells and if the bells stopped ringing, they'll pull the rope. They knew he was gone. He had to keep the bells ringing or they'll pull him out of there by his foot. The holy presence of God destroys sin. And any man who carries sin will be destroyed because of it. That's the old religion. The new religion offers us grace. It takes away religion and gives us relationship. So this place is open to us by Jesus, which is his own flesh. We have to come into him. And he puts his spirit into us. So there's a metamorphe, there's a transition, there's a changing of life. We can't add Jesus to our lives. We have to add our lives to his. We have to give ourselves away. We have to submit to his will. As we enter the holy, holiest place, We enter by his blood. So we take it seriously because the great sacrifice that was made that makes it possible for us to enter puts value in us or brings our attention to the great value, the high price that was paid. Not many of us would like us to see me take a sheep up here cut the throat, let the blood run out in a pan in front of everybody. You wouldn't like to see that. But that was the old religion. Far more would you like to see a human being being sacrificed in your presence. Many of us don't even want to see a dead body. But here was our Lord beaten, crowned with thorns, nailed to a cross, stripped naked, Artists put a little loincloth on him because they're uncomfortable. But he was stripped naked so that he will bear our nakedness, our shame was put on him. So that we would not have to face that anymore. Shame is a misplaced identity. When we don't really know who we are, we become ashamed. We put our heads down because we can't face the reality of what is, I don't know who I am. But he's saying in this lesson today, know who you are. As he said in Romans 8, we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters. We are 
children of God. And therefore, the Heavenly Father now has, we have access to him because of the price that Jesus paid at Calvary. That's what the text is saying. So why don't we consider the holiest place? The holiest place, Jesus said, is the closet, not some public demonstration of prayer where people look at you and think you're a prayer warrior. The holiest place is the closet where you quietly go knowing that you don't deserve all this, but you, you, you're thankful for it. So you come and you place yourself before him and say, Lord Jesus, thanks for your grace that's been extended. Thanks for your mercy that pardoned me. Thanks for your filling my life with all the good things, including your Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me and sanctify me and set me apart. I'm not worthy to be a part of your service, but I'm giving myself to it. Now tell me what it is you want me to do. Let your will be done in my life. When we appreciate the value And we think of the cost. We ask the question, so what must we be bold in? Here are three lessons from the text. What must we be bold in? Verse 22. Let us draw near. We must be bold in drawing near to our Heavenly Father. Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8 and he says, For I am persuaded that nothing, neither height nor depth, principalities nor powers, things to come or things past, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You ever thought of that? And young people, we go all over the place looking for love. But what we're really looking for is interaction. What we're look, really looking for is feelings. But this love he's talking about is commitment. Brian Anderson brought it to us, agape. Commitment. God's commitment to love us is so great. If we would just allow ourselves to ponder it, we, our lives would be enriched and refreshed. That God should love a sinner such as I. How wonderful is love like this. Let us draw near. Let us draw near. with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure. Faith comes into play. When we draw near to God, many times you don't hear him. He's trying to speak to us, but we're not used to hearing him. That still small voice that's in the inner man we're trying to hear him from the ears. I don't know if any of you would be so guilty as I am. I used to go into the forest to hunt. When I became a Christian, the forest is the most beautiful place in Canada. Wildlife all around you, squirrels and woodpeckers, all kinds of stuff. And I would, I would, I would separate myself from the other guys for a little bit and just listen. And it's as though my ears were throbbing. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's the blood pumping in my head. I'm so intense on trying to hear. But you don't hear God that way. Yes, he might speak to you audibly. He's capable of doing it, and I've heard of people saying so. But we hear from him. He speaks the language of the heart, 
That's where we have to listen. And it's very hard if we don't separate ourselves. In the busyness of life, our hearts racing and pumping to keep the blood flowing through our life, keep the life in our bodies so we could do the things that our ambition is set on. We have to shut it down and separate ourselves and say, God, now I'm here. Let the heart rest until you could hear the language of the heart where God speaks. He is writing on your heart. He's putting desires in your life. And he confirms them with peace. A peace that passes understanding. So let us draw near and by faith accept his cleansing. I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 1 and read what the Apostle Paul adds to this because it's, it's relevant Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 3 and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. In going without Christ. Just as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us or predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ in himself according to the good pleasure of his will this is God's will that we become these children who are flocking to him and the Holy of Holies open to us so we could come right into his presence. Therefore, come boldly under the throne of grace where you might find mercy in time of need. You'll find help in time of need. Two men, Joel Charles and Tebin, put this roof together. Walk upstairs and have a look. Of course, they used the machines, the Marshall Brothers lift the heavy beams, and that couldn't happen without that. But all the little network and nuts and bolts, and the rice man would tie the beams on the ground and they will pull it up and they will bolt the little pieces in place because they won't fit in they have to test them in different different places you know what reverend dr welsh said to me this wednesday as we were in prayer he says adrian what came to me as i was preparing our prayer meeting last tuesday is the roof at Gateway Assembly. I looked at it. It looks impossible for two men to do it. And I told them it, that's why it had to take prayer. Somebody was praying for those two men. I leave out the rice man, so it made three of them. Somebody was praying for them. No accident. And I believe that somebody is sitting right here this morning. Or that those somebodies. But they wouldn't pray for them walking. They separate themselves. And they go before their Father in heaven. And ask that he will give the wisdom and the guidance and keep these men safe as they continue to work on the church. And I don't have to thank those people because my Heavenly Father looks after those who draw near to Him. 
I don't even have to know who those people are because that's between him and them. And that's what I'm talking about, friends, that we need to understand that there's a washing and there's a cleansing, and there's a, but it was all planned from the foundation of the earth that we would be able to be that. And God also knew there'll be a lot of scoffers, people who just don't bother with it. A lot of people who would sit in churches and hear the message over and over and over and over and never make a decision to accept the love of God in their lives because they want to sit in the chair of authority. They want to sit in the chair of control. They want to hold the driver's wheel. They want to be the decision maker of their own life. And Heavenly Father is just wishing and hoping and has arranged everything and waiting. Verse 23 is another lesson for us. So what must we be bold in? Let us hold fast. See, to draw near is one thing, but then we have to hold fast. There must be a measure of tenacity in the life of the disciple of Christ because the enemy will always try to knock you out. I'm so thankful this morning. That lady, I don't even know her name, but God does, didn't accept the offer to take the ambulance and go to the hospital. But rather she chose prayer. I'm so thankful. It's a lesson for us. Because many of us choose the easy option first. We don't stand for the trials we don't hold fast to our confession of faith. We waver and wash. And James, the brother of Jesus, said, because you're back and forward like the sea, waves on the shore, you'll get nothing from your heavenly Father. You have to be anchored in Jesus. You have to be able to find yourself in the hollow of his hands until the storm passes by. You have to hold on because guaranteed we'll be tested. Our faith will be tested. And the subtle enemy, Paul writes about him, and he says his schemes. He doesn't stay because he's one, but he set up different schemes where you have people fighting against God's order. And denying God's people the privilege that God has made available to them by using close friends, relatives, and all the rest to say things and do things that demises the faith. Hold fast to your confession of faith. Confess it over and over. When it seems impossible, call on the name of the Lord. He will hear you. We don't walk this walk and succeed by losing focus. That's far too easy. Listen to what Paul tells us in second, sorry, in Colossians 2 and verse 8. From the time I heard this, I never let it go. It's a precious statement to my heart is sealed in there. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says to the Colossian church. Beware. We have signs here and there. Beware of the dogs. Beware. In short, be alert. We have to stay alert. Least anyone cheat you through Philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. People are spoiling the church everywhere you turn because we are gullible. But when we hold fast to our profession of faith, we hold fast 
and we stay focused on what the Lord has called us to, and we actively involved in getting the tasks done in the heat of the day with the sweat running down, we are strengthened by God. Think of Jesus in Gethsemane. He held fast to the instructions to face the cross. He pleaded that it would be removed. But he held fast to the instructions. And when it was over, he sweat blood. And the medical people say that if you're in deep contrition, indeed, blood vessels burst and come through your pores. Deep contrition. But he stayed focused. He said, not my will, but thine. And then angels came and strengthened him. The ministering angels are waiting to strengthen us, but we give up too quickly. We are not understanding the word tenacity. We're not understanding the concept of holding fast. We let go too quickly, and then we let people spoil us with their ideas, the philosophy of the world. You know what you should do? Yes, I know what I should do. But you don't like nobody to tell you what to do? Not really. I love when I ask for help that people give me ideas, but I'm not asking anybody to make a decision and not making decisions for people. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Lord gave us as a privilege as sons of God. Let him make the decisions and the peace of God rises up in us to confirm it. But we must hold fast. So not only we draw near, but we hold fast. Third one, let us, how must we be bold? Or what must we be bold in? Verse 24 and 25. Back to the text, so I could read it directly from the text. Verse 24 and verse 25. And let us consider one another. If a Christian has no consideration for others, he's not really born again. None of us can call on the name of Jesus and not consider our neighbor. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, the Apostle Paul writes to us in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 23. He said, let each person examine themselves. The responsibility for examination is on me, not you. Your responsibility of examination is on you. The Lord helps you with your examination. And as you ask God's forgiveness, his grace is sufficient. And therefore, grace is greater than sin. And that's how we partake. But he says, if you're not able to do that, if you're not willing to do that, and you eat without self-examination, and you eat recklessly and carelessly because you want nobody to know that something is wrong, so you eat in two, or you don't care, you're not discerning the body of Christ. He's not talking, the Apostle Paul is not talking about the body of Christ that was buried in the grave and resurrected. He's talking about the body of Christ, the ecclesia, the called out ones. We are his hands, we are his feet, we are his eyes and his ears. We are the body of Christ. We, the church, you're not acknowledging your brothers and sisters, you don't give consideration, so therefore sickness and premature, premature death comes into the family when we no, do not discern the body of Christ. So 
So let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You know me, you tell somebody, no, when you demonstrate love and you practice good works, you stimulate others. They feel somehow, you know, I should have been doing that. I could have done that. I want to do that. I know why I'm doing that. A stimulation takes place as we start to pour our love out on one another. And those in our community and ever it spreads, it spreads throughout. People cannot resist the love of God unless they scoff us. But we must consider one another. We must consider one another. James, the brother of Jesus, say, consider others more highly than your own self. Whew, that one is not easy. I'm still working on it. You see, by integrating ourselves, the church becomes alive and active as it ought to be. We become the living organism that is described when we read the Hebrew text, I mean the Greek text that it was written in that Apostle Paul taught from. And all the lessons come out richly that we stimulate one another. It's an interactive kind of love. We don't turn people away. We don't turn people down. We don't put them down. We, we don't bad mouth because you know, that's my brother. That's my sister. And if we did and we slip up, we ask forgiveness. If we can't find them, we could ask God to work it out. And he will, if you're genuine. But you also have to consider working on yourself so you don't keep bad mountain. Galatians chapter 6. You like this one, I'm sure. I'm almost at the end. Beginning at verse 6. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Let him who's taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. I love Gateway Assembly for that. We always have people who are being taught bringing gifts. Somebody bring them baskets of mangoes and seasoning peppers and beans and whatever. And, and, and that, that's already working here. We just need to be more active in it as best we can as the Lord lays it on your heart. Don't do it out of compulsion. Do it out of joy and bring as you are blessed. Do not be, see sorry, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to how many? All. Especially those who are of the household of faith. Amen. What shall we say then? Let's close the service and we will do our communion. Can anybody find an excuse to avoid being an active Christian? Question, can anybody find an excuse to avoid being an active Christian? You'll see a lot of people who come and they want to impose their will on others. They don't want to give. What they want to do is influence. That's not giving. That's taking. And often they rob you 
because it's vain, this seat. It's not of God. Or they want to show themselves as more spiritual, so they put on a little show. That is not giving, that is robbing. They're taking from us. Instead of allowing God, spirit to work in the lives of his people, they interject my opinion. What do you think? I want to add to what you had to say. Why? Because they want to be heard. Why? Because they're looking for preeminence. That's not what he's talking about at all. He's talking about the boldness to do the will of God. When you know the will of God, and the will of God is to draw near to God. He wants us to draw near. The will of God is to hold fast to our faith. And the will of God is to let us consider one another. Which of these, listen to me carefully, which of these do you fit into? Which of these do you see yourselves involved in? Which of these do you see as already part of your life? Would you stand with me?